being saved. This is the word of the Lord. I suppose we all have our idea of what makes the church the church. And as Robert said, I'm a fourth or fifth generation cradle Presbyterian, don't know anything else. And so, and I'm an historian by education. So I decided to go to the denomination sources and, and our Scots confession just has just some great language. The true church exists where the word of God is truly preached and heard. And that's a key. You got to listen and hear it. The sacraments are rightly administered and ecclesiastical discipline is uprightly ministered. Now, I love that language, but it's a little stiff. Wouldn't you agree? So look at our book of order, which has done a better job, I think, emphasizing that the true church nurtures a covenant community of disciples of Christ, living in the strength of God's promises and giving itself in service to God's mission. All right, some better. Not much, but some better. But maybe we'd be better off by using the words of a hymn, children's song, I found in the Methodist hymn. You may know it. The church is not a building. Thank you. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the... Thank you. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All who follow Jesus, all who find the world. Yes, we're the church together. Good job. You all look excellent. Well, I think if we look at this text this morning, we may get some signs of what made the early church the church. And quite frankly, I think we can learn something from it. And if you look at the text, you get four things that made the early church the church, which completely blows the old idea of a three-point sermon. And it's listed, and you're going to be tested on it. So be prepared. Teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer. Teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer. That's what made the early church, the church. All those converts who responded to Peter's amazing sermon that Pentecost day, 3,000 of them, according to the text, had to put flesh on their new faith by trying to learn all they could about the apostles' teaching, by spending time with each other together in fellowship, by breaking bread, sharing meals, and by bowing together in times of prayer. And if anybody had any struggles, if any of their numbers needed anything, they all came together to jump into hell. That's, that's what makes the church the church. And according to Scripture, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. No wonder they grew. They were being the church. Luke begins his description with an interesting choice of word. He uses the word devoted which the Greek word Greek root word is and my Greek is terrible proskotero convince a sense of real urgency earnest being diligent so these new Christians were earnest diligent about being Christians so I guess the question is how are we doing in that department are we earnest? Are we diligent? Can we learn from these early followers? I think we can. So first, number one, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And that makes sense because they had a lot to learn, didn't they? And a lot of these folks may have followed Jesus, but most were not, may have had some good religious background. Some may have seen him or heard him. But for whatever reason, they've not followed very closely after that. And after all, it's been 50 days since the resurrection. And the resurrection creates some issues too. They needed to learn. And that's the case for every generation, isn't it? 
Even though some of us may have been born into a Christian home, the details of our faith are not picked up by osmosis. We might like to think it is, but it's not. We have to be taught. And in the earliest times, we are going to be taught by dedicated parents and brothers and sisters and grandparents. But there comes a time when the teaching is concentrated here in the family of faith, the church. Henry Ward Beecher once said, the church is not a gallery for the exhibition of eminent Christians, but a school for the education of imperfect ones. After all, folks, the root word of the meaning disciple is learner. So, we need to keep learning. We keep coming back. We're coming back to Sunday school, to Bible study, coming back to worship. We're always learning. Aren't we? Are we always coming back? Okay. Feeling a little hesitation here. I don't know about any of you, but I sometimes wonder about our teaching and learning standards. They seem to be a little more minimal than they were when, when I was growing up. You know, in ancient Israel, rabbis memorized all the scriptures, not just those neat few verses that we are prone to do. In our day, students of Islam are expected to memorize the entire Quran, which is about the size of our New Testament. Takes three days to recite that, by the way. So, as part of our teaching, should we require every Christian to memorize the New Testament? That's a little strong. How about just give me the books of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts, Epistle to the Romans. My giggy, good Southern Baptist, offered me a dollar if I could recite to her the books of the New Testament, which I did. She offered me the same dollar if I could recite the books of the Old Testament, and I turned her down. I asked for a dollar and a half. <laughs> Why? I'm big on congregational participation here. There are more books in the Old Testament, of 50% more. Anybody know how many books in the total books in the Bible? 66. Okay. So, let's struggle with that. How about the Ten Commandments in order? How about the names of the Twelve Apostles? Peter, Andrew, James, and John, fishermen of Capernaum. And I'm looking out here, and there are some of you all that are at least as young as I am. And remember... When Mr. Belk gave us a dollar, if we could recite the children's catechism. Anybody remember? Ah, there's one. Who made you? God. What else did God make? God made me in all things. Why did God make you in all things? For his own glory. How ought you to glorify God? By loving him and doing what he commands. Gave you a bunch of stuff. Can I give you a quiz on it and you pass it? Then maybe we need to concentrate on our learning, don't we? Well, maybe though, we can get some of it by osmosis. So maybe if we just come to church every week, that'll kind of lead into the fellowship thing. You know, there are polls out everywhere talking about religious conduct and attitudes and beliefs and the changes, the answers change over the years, but some of them are amazingly consistent. 95% of us profess a belief in God. 85% of us believe that the Ten Commandments are still valid for today, although over half of the people who say that can't name five of them. 
And as for church attendance, things get very distressing because only half the people say they think it's important to belong to a church. In fact, 75% have said it's a, you can be a good Christian without going to church. Well, I believe you can be a good person. I bet you all know a lot of good people that don't go to church. But I don't buy the fact that you can be a good Christian and not come to church and be part of this. Thank you. As the text said, one of the things to which the believers were devoted to was fellowship. Pastor was once asked how he defined faithful attendance in church. And he said, well, all I ask is that we apply the same standards of faithfulness to our church activities that we would in other areas of our life. That doesn't seem to be too much to ask. So, consider these examples. If your car started one out of every three times, would you consider that a faithful car? If you didn't show up for work two to three times a month, would your boss call you faithful? If your refrigerator quit every now and then, would you say, oh, well, it works most of the time? If you miss a couple of mortgage payments during the year, would your mortgage banker say, oh, well, 10 out of 12 ain't bad? If you miss worship, and other church events and only show up every now and then on high holy days or enough to keep your name on the roll, are you faithful? Some have suggested that the real miracle of Pentecost is found right in that devotion to fellowship. And think about it, there was a huge diverse assemblage of people. What does the earlier scripture say? People gathered in Jerusalem from every nation under the sun. And out of that, a unified group of believers was formed. They talked together. They laughed together. They sang together. Remember what the pastors by on Pentecost morning thought at 9 o'clock? They thought they were drunk. What a joyous time they had together. And isn't that what life in the church is supposed to be about? Fellowship events, fellowship suppers, ball games, Montreat, youth trips, golf outings, movie nights. These things may not seem very spiritual to many people, but Christian fellowship is one of the greatest gifts that the church has to offer. Now, you don't even have to be a Christian to understand the importance of fellowship. Harry Golden, the wonderful Jewish storyteller and publisher of the Carolina Israelite, tells of a time in his youth when he asked his Jewish father, who was not a believer, Papa, Papa, why do you go to synagogue every Sunday if you don't believe in God? Harry's father said, ah, Jews go to synagogue for all sorts of reasons. My friend Garfinkel, who is orthodox, goes to talk to God. I, I go to synagogue so I can talk to Garfinkel. Fellowship. It's important. Teaching. Fellowship. Breaking bread. You knew I was going to get to the good part after a while. It's important that we eat. This bread breaking was probably a bigger deal than we give credit for. Because remember, this was a disparate group. They were from everywhere. Rich, poor, male, female, slave, free, blah, blah. Different folks. And whether we want to admit it or not, there are times in our lives that we don't want to just share a meal with anyone. Some years back, a young family knew the community began attending a particular church. 
It was close to their home. They enjoyed the worship. The kids liked the Sunday school. They had a vibrant youth program. This looked like the church for them. And one Sunday, soon after they began attending, a congregational meal was scheduled following the worship. Now here is where I have to back off and tailor to my audience. Because if we were out in the country, where I was last week, Potts Memorial Oak, Plain of whatever, it would be a covered dish lunch in which everybody would bring fried chicken in their best casseroles and you work the lines back and forth. I've learned the hard way that bigger churches like to cater. So we're going to assume that in this particular church that day, this was a catered meal. So they came in and they went through the line and they found a table and went and sat down, ate their meal, and then they left and they never bothered to come back again. Anybody got any idea why they never came back? Nobody talked to them. Nobody sat with them. Wasn't the food. Food was great. Best caterer in town. Nobody sat with them. Nobody welcomed them. That told them that this place was not the church for them. Breaking bread is a big deal, especially when everyone is included. One of my church members at Pollux, well, at least he said this before the, the COVID, complained that all we did was eat. And to me, it seems that it goes with the importance of devoting ourselves to fellowship, to breaking bread, to nurturing relationships, and seeing what it's like to be part of the family of faith. My old college professor, Dr. Doug Hicks, preached a series of sermons one time, and one of his sermons was entitled, Why Christians Should Eat Together. And the emphasis on his message was this text and several others which basically said every major event in the life and ministry of Jesus and in the life of the early church revolved around a meal. So we need to be eating more. That's the only thing I can say. So we worked hard at Pollocksville before COVID to try to eat once a month. No real program, just a family meal. My contention is you have to eat supper somewhere. Why not eat with your family? My attitude was that if every Baptist church in the world can meet every Wednesday night and eat, then the only Presbyterian church in Jones County ought to be figure out a way to do it once a month. <laughs> Folks, Scripture hints that churches that eat together and fellowship together grow, not just calorically, but statistically. Teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer. prayer. Thank you. Y'all are good now because I'm going to ask you about these later. They devoted themselves to prayer. More accurately, according to the Greek text, the prayers. What is probably being referred to here are the Jewish prayers and psalms which were said at stated times of the day. Remember, these folks continued to think of themselves as Jews, which is why the text says that they continued to meet together in the temple for prayers. Folks, regardless of whether it is rehearsed or extemporaneous prayer, the act of taking time out of the routine and rush of the day to pray is one of the aspects that sustains the community. And this is one area that we could probably learn something from our devout Muslim friends. I was always struck by the fact that President John Kennedy's mother, Ms. Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, went to Mass every morning of her life. And she lived until she was 100. And for those of you who are familiar, basically Catholic Mass is just a, a prayer service. I thought that was a bit excessive. And then, again, before COVID, we started doing early morning prayer at Pollocksville 
during Holy Week. And there's something about getting up at 6.30, 6.45 and trudging over to the church for 20 minutes of prayer that can help make the day. I was impressed by the blessing of your youth and all the people that came up to pray for your youth. And in a week or so, the General Assembly starts, and I can remember when I served as a commissioner for there, we would get in some of the most cantankerous, contentious things, and all of a sudden the moderator would just stop and say, each of you get in your groups and hold hands and circle up and pray together. It's important. It's important. Not just individual, but corporate prayer. So, the result of all this devotion to teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer was a group that produced, according to Scripture, wonders and miraculous signs, not the least of which was that they were all together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to those who have need. Now, someone would say, oh, Jay, that's communist. We can't do that. Well... The Shakers have kind of tried, and the Mormons have kind of tried, and other utopian groups have tried. But don't we still try when we find one of our own is in need? Don't we respond? Don't we do a special offering? Don't we take food? Don't we reach out to others? By the way, did you notice the phrase near the end of the lesson, the church went about its business enjoying the favor of all people? In other words, people like those church folks. They were likable people. And in a way, I hate to mention it because I would wish that any time someone thought of the church, whatever church that might be, it would bring a smile to faces. But not so much these days. Sadly, in our nation, the attention that the church has gotten has not usually been very smile-producing. It goes to the extreme religious right and their mean-spirited attacks on anyone who doesn't buy into their social agenda or to sexual predators who have upset the church in all denominations to the far left that seems to justify every social issue with differing interpretations of scripture I want things to be like it used to be a church that enjoys the favor of all people then it would certainly follow that the Lord would add daily to their number so what makes the church the church Teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer. A winning combination, wouldn't you say? And yet sometimes tough to attain. Author James Hewlett offered the following adaptation of Joyce Kilmer's very familiar poem. I wish, I think that I shall never see a church that's all it ought to be. A church whose members never stray beyond the straight and narrow way. A church that has no empty pews, whose pastor never has the blues. A church whose elders always speak and none is proud and all are meek. Such perfect churches there never may be. There may be, but none of them is known to me. But still, we work and we pray and we plan to make our church the best we can. Two boys were talking about knowing the ark. They were talking about the odor and the noise and the inconvenience of being cooped up in the boat with all those animals crowded and dirty and smelly and the problem of separating animals who don't usually get along with each other and one of the boys said I just don't think I could stand that and the other little boy thought for a while he said yeah it must have been pretty bad but think of it the other way 
It was the best thing afloat. <laughs> Folks, that's what I believe about the church. Sometimes, many times, it is not the most exciting place to be. And part of it's our fault. And sometimes, church people are not all they ought to be. But still, it's the best thing afloat. I'm glad I'm in the church. I'm glad I'm in this church this morning. And I hope you are too. Amen.